As, as we make our way back to our seats, we have some very special guests with us today. FYI, if it's ringing, stand right in the middle of the room. That roof does weird things to our sound system. So, we have very special guests I would like to welcome today. Bishop Warren Hoffman from the Pacific BIC and his wonderful wife, Connie, has joined us today. So, I will turn this over to you as okay. instructed. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. It's good to be with you. I am, I am a, a bishop, a temporary one. I'm filling in between Bishop Perry and when we get a new bishop, interim bishop. And so Connie and I are normally live in Pennsylvania, but we're here during this time uh, to fill in and, and be your bishop. One of the perks of this job is to getting to go from church to church and worship with different churches. And so we, I must admit, we enjoy the worship and the variations of worship that we experience. When we get down to the churches, we've gotten down to churches in Miami, Spanish language churches, and there they bring their Bibles and their tambourines. And we worship with, we worship with Navajos in New Mexico, and they worship around a huge drum. Uh, and that's special in its own way. Now, once we were down in, in, in Virginia, southern Virginia, and Connie actually played her violin with the worship band that they have there. And someone explained to her the difference between a violin and a fiddle. They said the violin has strings and the fiddle has strangs. <laughs> so the next time we come and you need a violin or a fiddle, I could maybe prevail upon Connie to bring it. Anyway, it's good to be here. Uh, as you likely know, uh, this Pacific Conference is a cluster of 19 churches, and 15 are here in the valley, and one's up in the Central Valley, and then are three up in Oregon. And it's Connie's and my responsibility to care for the pastors in those churches and the people in those churches during this time uh, that we're here. Uh, the, here in the valley, the churches span all the way from here to Duarte, 50 miles, and we're all within a circumference uh, of, of, of that. I had the privilege of meeting earlier with Pastor Martin and then with your elders. You guys have the earliest elder meeting of anybody, <coughs> any church I know, but it worked, it worked, seven o'clock on Saturday morning. And now I'm having the privilege to meet with all of you. And the point of those meetings was that with our church family, we don't give pastors a life sentence necessarily. <clears throat> we have terms, and it's normally a three-year term, term or a five-year term, and Pastor Martin's term came up a few months ago. He's been untermed for a while, uh, and so we're trying to rectify that. And so the way we do it is uh, we, we, we want agreement among three parties, and that's the bishop, uh, the elders, or the, or the governing board, whichever it is in a church, and, and the pastor and wife. And we also get the counsel of the people. And so you've done that, those of you that filled out those questionnaires that we had. And so it's my privilege to let you know this morning that all of us are in agreement, and we would like Pastor Martin and Sue to continue for another five years. <clears throat> And so it's my sense that you have a good partnership here. Now, I've only been here two and a half months, so I may be wrong, but it's my sense that you've got a good partnership between pastors and elders and pastors and elders and people and school and youth and all the rest. And so I'm just happy to bless you in that and to pray uh, for, for Pastor Martin and Sue in just a moment. But I, I do want to say a word about Tim and the contribution that he is making on your behalf to the youth of our conference. And there's a team of youth pastors that get together, if I, as I understand it, every year and pull together a wonderful winter retreat for the kids. And so I just want to salute uh, Tim, too, uh, along with Pastor Martin for the work he's doing. <clears throat> now let me read, before, before we pray, <clears throat> for Pastor Martin and Sue, let me read why it is that pastors are so important. This is out of Ephesians 4, where the Lord told us through the Apostle Paul that Jesus gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and pastor teachers. And so 
One person cannot do it all. That's why we partner together. That's why we come alongside Pastor Martin and Sue to work with them, to be a team. And the whole point of the team, particularly the pastor, is to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, we're not there yet, but that's where we're aiming. And that's what Pastor Martin's call is, and all of us with him, together, to raise up and become like Jesus and to do his work here on earth. And if I may, I'd like to pray with you all now for that. So, so Martin and Sue, if you'd come up, and elders, if you would come and join me and lay hands on them, uh, we're going to pray on behalf of you all. <coughs> that the Lord will accomplish that through us, through you. Let's pray together, shall we? Lord God, we thank you for the sovereign way that you work in our lives. You are indeed chasing us. By your Holy Spirit, you chase us until you track us down and you capture us and overcome us. And you've done that with our pastor and wife. You're doing that with all of us. And there are more people that you want to do that through us as your church here in this place. And so in these moments, afresh and anew, just like we sang just a few moments ago, we ask you to come upon us by your Holy Spirit in power and in might, and in all the gifts and graces of your character, so that this passage might be fulfilled. That this brother and sister, with all of us, Lord, might be faithful to equip the saints, so that together we might come to the kind of unity of love that is a powerful witness to a world that's just so broken and hurting and lost. And help us, Lord Jesus, as you do this in our midst, to be the kind of people that reflect your character, to grow up into the manhood, the womanhood, of what it means to be like you, to reflect your glory here on earth. And so in a fresh new way today, as Pastor Martin begins this new term of service for five years, we pray that you will do that in power, in might, in and through us here in this place, in this community in this part of your world. And all this, Jesus, we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bishop. I'm going to have to set this down while I move the pulpit. It has been a privilege and an honor to serve. Um, I will tell you that there have been numerous times over the course of our time here that the Lord has paraded each and every one of your faces in front of me and said, do you love him? And I've answered yes. So thank you. Thank you. Hmm. Sweetie, are my glasses on that chair? <sighs> Thank you. It is not good that man should be alone. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, we are in Genesis, and today we, we will be continuing through Genesis chapter 30. We're going to pick up in verse 25. Full disclosure on a couple of things. We will run late today. Amen? Yeah, we, we won't go extremely late, I don't think, but we are going to run over today. The message that the Lord gave me today is a big picture tapestry, and it needs to be complete. And so we, we might run a little long. I uh, also want to thank Bishop and Connie for joining us today. It's an honor and a privilege to meet you. It's been good to meet you and visit. I've, we love you guys. All right, so Genesis chapter 30, verse 25. Hold your finger there for a second, and we are going to do a Pastor Martin's Warp Speed intro. But we will pray first. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. And Jesus, as you said, as you told the Pharisees, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have life, but it is they which testify of me. And so, Lord, we know that these scriptures that you've given us from Genesis to Revelation is a glorious picture of your love for your creation, your love for mankind, and the links that you would go through to redeem us from our own wretchedness. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for the instruction we get. We thank you for the correction that we get. And we thank you for the knowledge of our Lord and Savior and our God and our King that we find in your holy scriptures. So open your word to our eyes today. Show us wonderful things in your word and our desires that we leave here today changed, having been in your presence, worshiped at your throne, sat at your feet, and listened to your spirit speak to us. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, warp speed intro, Genesis chapter 30. I'm ringing a lot. Is there someone at the board that can fix that? Thank you. I got to walk around for this one. All right, warp speed intro. So as we discussed, in this chapter, in the events that are taking place here, we've had four major players. We had Isaac, we had Rebecca, we had Jacob, and we had Esau. All four of those players went off script, got off trail, and got it wrong. Not one of those, not one of those four, did things in a godly manner. So they all went off script. And we know the results of that. Jacob, listening to his mother, dressed up in sheep's clothes and his brother's clothes. I assume they stink from the field. Yeah. So he dressed up all this. He, you know, he put the farce across. He convinces his dad. He deceives him. Esau, who had sold his birthright, was pursuing what his dad told him to do in quick fashion, go out, hunt, bring some game, because Esau wants the blessing even though he knows he sold it, and he really didn't care about it. He sold it, but he still wants it. Isaac is going to bless his son in silence in, in what amounts to a secret meeting. The blessing should have taken place in a public setting with all the children, all the family as a celebration. But Isaac tells his son, go get the meat and bring it back here. The intent is to do this quietly. So Jacob doesn't get upset. And Rebecca doesn't get upset because you see, Isaac also knows that the birthright is supposed to go to Jacob. So Isaac's trying to circumvent God's will. Esau is trying to circumvent God's will. Rebecca, who's been eavesdropping, here's the plan. She sends it to her son, tell, convinces her son how he's going to deceive the father, so he does all that. So Rebecca's eavesdropping. She's not circumventing the plan, but she's trying to help God bring it to pass. She's getting in the middle of God's doing and inserting her own efforts. Jacob does the same. He's deceiving him. He gets in the middle of God's plan. Now, it was God's plan all along that he would inherit the blessing. Not being judgmental, but the right thing to do would have been for all four of the players to step back and say, God, you have already said this is your will. How do we bring it to pass? But no, being human, they jumped in there, God, we're obviously going to have to help you out with this because we don't know how you're going to figure it out, so clearly you haven't figured it out. So let's jump in here and get her done. All right, so, so that all happens. Now Esau is angry. He's going to kill his brother Jacob. Rebecca hears this and gets the murder plot, so she tells her son, we, Jacob, we need to send you away for a few days until your brother's anger subsides, and then we'll call you back. 
Interestingly enough, she has to present this. Now, I'm inferring this. She presents it to Isaac so that Isaac thinks it's his idea. Isaac convinces his son, you need to depart and go find a wife. Back at our father's house, back in our land. But he doesn't mention anything to Jacob about the murder plot, which Jacob clearly knows, and so does Rebecca. Okay, so he runs for a few days. A fifth player is introduced when Jacob meets Laban and gets a collegiate level Masters of Manipulation class <laughs> under Dr. Laban. And his tutelage is severe and very effective. There's the first seven years of service for Rachel. He meets Rachel, falls in love with her right away. He wants her. He serves seven years. It flashes by as a day. And surprise, day after wedding morning, Leah. Uh-oh, what's happened here? Well, he's been tricked. So Laban explains to him, it's not done so in our country that the firstborn should not inherit. You gotta wonder if maybe Laban, I'm just, I'm just questioning, maybe Laban knew what Jacob had done. Hmm. If he didn't, Jacob certainly did. Don't think for a minute that didn't go through his mind when he realized he'd been tricked. This is, this is a very expensive lesson on diplomacy and birthrights. Okay, so he still loves Rachel. Goes to Laban, what's up with this? All right, it's not our culture to do that. So we, we gave you Leah. But if you want to serve at us another seven years, we'll give you Rachel as well. All right, so he does it. Seven years of service. In this time period, in his last seven years of service, all kinds of marriage drama plays out. Leah and Rachel are vying for Jacob's attention and for his love. Rachel has it in spades. Leah doesn't. So there's contention, there's friction. You know, part of the family is unloved and part of it's loved. Jacob clearly has favorites. There is vying for attention for offspring. There's despair, there's hope, there's joy, there's faith. There's disbelief. There's all kinds of drama that plays out in this family between Rachel, Leah, and between their handmaidens. They're even giving their handmaidens to produce more offspring. offspring. There's more drama, etc., etc. There's even a part when Leah's son, Reuben, procures some aphrodisiacs from the field, brings them to his mother, and his mother, Leah, negotiates with Rachel, do I have children in here? Negotiates with Rachel to amend or make adjustments to Jacob's schedule of husbandly duties roster. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. So the roster has been adjusted and the schedule adjusted and so Jacob trades knights. We're gonna leave it like that, okay? <laughs> and I talked about this a few weeks ago and really scratching my head because to have your son involved in your love life is a very odd thing. It's a very odd thing. I, I can't see in my family, my, my mother, I was like, mom, you handle your business, leave me alone. <laughs> Don't want to know, don't want to hear. But anyway, so there is a tremendous amount of drama that goes on in this family, right? Now, at this point where we pick up in verse 25, the 14 years of service for Jacob's wives are up, and he's free to go. He now has 11 sons plus Dinah. Now, Benjamin will be born later. Benjamin's not born yet at this time. So we join the text with Jacob's conversation with Laban about his departure. So we're going to pick up Genesis 30, verse 25. And it came to pass when Rachel had born Joseph that Jacob said to Laban, Send me away that I may go to my own place and to my country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you and let me go, for you know my service which I have done for you. And Laban said, Please stay if I have found favor in your eyes, for I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. Take note of his language and the tone of it. It's very friendly. 
Please stay. I have noticed that God has blessed me because of you. Okay? And then he said, name your wages and I will give it. Laban sees further opportunity for gain from Jacob's service. Just because the words are nice doesn't mean Laban is not Laban anymore. Laban is still looking for opportunity, and he sees one here. He's certainly no dummy. So Jacob said to him, you know how I have served you and how your livestock has been with me. For what you had before I came was little, and it has increased to a great amount. The Lord has blessed you since my coming, and now what shall I also provide for my own house? Remember these passages. The Lord has blessed you greatly for my sake. Now what shall I provide for my own house? Remember, all of Jacob's hard work to this point has been 14 years of hard service, and Jacob had a fantastic work ethic. He worked hard. 14 years for his two wives and the children that they produced. If he leaves now, he leaves with his wives and children and nothing else. So basically his family and the clothes on their back. So he said, what shall I give you? And Jacob said, you shall not give me anything. That is a lesson that we need today, folks. Our nation, our country, our world needs that lesson more than any other. You shall not give me anything. Our people walk around. We walk around with our hands out. What can we be given? Will the government take care of my health care? Will the government provide me with housing? Is the government going to give me food? Is this person going to give me this? Is that person going to give me this? That's not godly. That's not God honoring. Jacob did not honor God that way. You shall give me nothing. What can I work for? You see, that's how God gives to us. God gives us opportunities. If a man not work, let him not eat. God opens doors for us to serve. God opens ways for us to work. He put Adam in the garden and he told him, tend the garden, work. We are not destined to be handout people. We are children of the king. And the king will open doors for us to serve. Amen? The king will open doors of opportunity. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I've joked around sometimes and said, Lord, it's pretty needy. Can you sell a few of them cows? But the thing is, if we do all things as unto Christ, that includes our work. Open doors for us, Lord. Open ways that we can not only provide for our family, but we can serve you and the needs of your church. And God honors that. He continues, if you will do this thing for me, I will again feed and keep your flocks. Let me pass through all your flock today, removing from there all the speckled and spotted sheep and all the brown ones among the lambs and the spotted and speckled among the goats. And these shall be my wages. So my righteousness... So my righteousness will answer for me in time to come. When the subject of my wages come before you, every one that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and brown among the lambs will be considered stolen if it is with me. And Laban said, oh, that it were according to your word. Something very interesting in verse 33. So my righteousness will answer for me in time to come when the subject of my wages comes before you. Jacob didn't just say, I've given you my word, take it at face value and leave me alone. He said, my righteousness will come before you. My righteousness will show. Jesus said, you will know them by their fruit. These are universal tenets. If we are being conformed into the image and likeness of Christ, our righteousness will come up because his righteousness is shining through. Our deeds should follow our words. Empty words are just that, empty. It's a basket full of holes, won't hold anything. Verse 35. So he removed that day the male goats that were speckled and spotted, all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one that had some white in it, and all the brown ones among the lambs, and gave them into the hand of his sons. Then he put three days' journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. 
Now Jacob took for himself rods of green poplar and the almond and chestnut trees, peeled white strips in them and exposed the white which was in the rods. And the rods which he had peeled he set before the flocks in the gutters and the watering troughs where the flocks came to drink so that they should conceive when they came to drink. So the flocks conceived before the rods and the flocks brought forth streaked, speckled, and spotted. Now there has been a lot of discussion over this over the years and there is some scientific evidence that what livestock, sheep in particular, what they're thinking about and what they're visualizing has an effect on their offspring if they're looking at this while they are in process. That it, it can have a physical effect. Whether or not this is actual, whether it's true, there's some debate about that. But what is clear is that I shouldn't say this is clear, it's not clear yet. It will be in a few more verses. This is something that God has shown Jacob to do. Now whether he knows it because it's a fact, a livestock issue, or whether God has told him to do this and he does it in faith, the result is the same. God does the work, right? Jacob had his part to play, he plays his part, the results are up to God, amen? That's another lesson we gotta learn. We all have our part to play. We have service that we do for the Lord. The results are His. The results are not ours. I've said this here in this congregation hundreds if not many, many hundreds of times. It's our job to be faithful. It's our job to preach Christ and Him crucified. It's our job to teach and preach the Word of God. It's His job to fill these seats. We don't do this to get people in the door and make converts to Valley Christian. We do God's work for Christ's glory, and he sends the increase. The result is Christ. The Holy Spirit does his work. All right, moving on. Verse 40. Then Jacob separated the lambs and made the flocks face towards the street and all the brown in the flocks of Laban. But he put his own flocks by themselves and did not put them with Laban's flock. And it came to pass, whenever the stronger livestock conceived, that Jacob placed the rods before the eyes of the livestock in the gutters that they might conceive among the rods. But when the flocks were feeble, he did not put them in, so the feebler were Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. Ever the workman, isn't he? Thus the man became exceedingly prosperous and had large flocks, female and male servants, and camels and donkeys. Chapter 31, verse 1. Now Jacob heard the words of Laban's son saying, Jacob has taken away all that was our father's and from what was our father's, he has inquired all this wealth. And Jacob saw the countenance of Laban and indeed it was not favorable towards him as before. Remember the kind words? Those are over. His countenance, his face has changed. He is not friendly anymore. Laban has realized his opportunity has turned and things aren't going his way. There's a dramatic difference and a shift in the attitude towards Jacob that's taking place here. Verse three, then the Lord said to Jacob, return to the land of your fathers and to your family and I will be with you. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field, to his flock, and he said to them, I see your father's countenance that it is not favorable towards me as before but the God of my father has been with me. Do not ever forget that. Throughout God's word, you will see this thousands and thousands of times. God has been with his own. He has never left them. He has never forsaken them. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. God has been with Jacob just as he's been with us. Amen? And you know that with all my might, I have served your father. It's a great work, work ethic. Yet your father has deceived me, Jacob, whose name means heel catcher, deceiver. Your father has deceived me. <laughs> I think he's just mad because Laban's better at it. All right, anyway, sorry. Your father has deceived me and changed my wages 10 times. Take note of this as well. But God did not allow him to hurt me. 
Who's in charge? God's in charge. If he said thus, the speckled shall be your wages, then all the flocks bore speckled. And if he said thus, the streaked shall be your wages, then all the flocks bore streaked. So God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. And it happened at that time when the flocks conceived that I lifted up my eyes and I saw in a dream and behold, the rams which leaped upon the flocks were streaked, speckled and gray spotted. I would pose to you that this is a possible hint that God had revealed to Jacob what it was he should do. There's a premise, a tenet in scripture that says without what? It's impossible to please him? Without faith. What is faith? Faith is hearing God's direction and doing it. Simple as it gets. Faith is not a roll of the dice hoping it works out. That's just hope. That's random chance. Faith is hearing God's instructions and operating in them. So I would pose to you that Jacob, even though it seems kind of shady or misunderstood, I pose that God had probably showed Jacob what it was he should do, and he's doing that. Then the angel of God spoke to me in a dream. Did I miss a verse? No? Oh, thank you. Then the angel of God spoke to me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, Here I am. And he said, Lift up your eyes now and see. All the rams which leap on the flocks are streaked and speckled and gray spotted. For I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now rise, get out of this land, and return to the land of your family. Then Rachel and Leah answered and said to him, Is there any portion or inheritance for us in our father's house? In other words, what's left for us here? He's, he's telling them what's going on. And he's basically asking them, are you going to go with me? Like, well, what's left here? And they continue, are we not considered strangers by him? For he has sold us and also completely consumed our money. For all these riches which God has taken from our father are really ours and our children's. Now then, whatever God has said to you, do it. You see, they're no dummies either. They know that God has transferred the majority of Laban's wealth over to Jacob. If they get rebellious and decide, no, we're not going, we're just going to stay in our father's house, there ain't much left there for them. So they're not dummies either. Verse 17, Then Jacob rose and set his sons on his and his wives on camels, and he carried away all of his livestock, all of his possessions which he had gained, his acquired livestock which he'd gained in Padan Aram to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. Now, they're departing in secret. So the initial question is, why are they going away in secret? Last time it was a celebration. He came to Laban. Hey, I've done my 14 years. It's time to go. This time it's in secret. Well, he explains that to us later. Verse 19, now Laban had gone to shear his sheep and Rachel had stolen his household idols that were her father's. This is a very interesting passage that needs some explaining. Rachel took the little idols, the household idols, the household gods. And so Laban is going to pursue them with much vigor. The connotation being that these little idols were so valuable to him that he's going he's to chase them down. Now what we don't get from scripture, but we do get from historical reference is that these little household gods are called teraphim. These were connected to property ownership. Whoever had the, the teraphim, the handholds, owned the property. So in them stealing the teraphim, they've stolen his title deeds. No wonder he's so upset. You stole all my cattle, you took my daughters, you run away with my grandkids, and you took my title deeds. So there is some idol worship to it. There is also some legality to it. It was very important for them that the household gods stayed in the household because whoever had possession of them owned the land. Pretty wild, huh? Verse 20, And Jacob stole away, unknown to Laban the Syrian, in that he did not tell them that he intended to flee. So he fled with all that he had. He arose and crossed the river and headed towards the mountain of Gilead. And Laban was told on the third day that Jacob had fled. 
Then he took his brothers with him and pursued them for seven days' journey, and he overtook them in the mountains of Gilead. But God came to Laban the Syrian in a dream by night and said to him, Be careful that you speak to Jacob neither good nor bad. If you are underliners or highlighters of your Bible, I highly suggest you underline, highlight this verse, make a post-it of it. Speak, you shall speak. In other words, your opinion is irrelevant. Everybody has an opinion, right? There's times when God needs to step up and say, it's nice you have an opinion, but it's kind of irrelevant. All right, let's move on. <laughs> God came to Laban, the Syrian, in a dream, said to him, be careful that you speak to Jacob neither good nor bad. So Jacob overtook, excuse me, Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the mountains, and Laban with his brethren pitched in the mountains of Gilead. And Laban said to Jacob, what have you done that you've stolen away unknown to me and carried away my daughters like captives taken with a sword? Why did you flee away secretly and steal away from me and not tell me? For I might, I might, doesn't say you would have, I might have sent you away with joy and songs, with timbrel and harp, and you did not allow me to kiss my sons and my daughters. Now you've done foolishly in doing so. It is in my power to do you harm. And in this, he was entirely mistaken. It was not within Laban's power to do him harm. God would not have allowed it. Just saying. But Laban thinks it was. It is in my power to do you harm. But the God of your father spoke to me last night saying, Be careful that you speak to Jacob neither good nor bad. And now you have surely gone because you greatly long for your father's house. But why did you steal my gods? See, when we understand that these were his title deeds, it makes sense why they would be inserted here. If they were simply idols, he could have went and got some taters and carved some more. That's all an idol is. Just get some potatoes, get some wood, get some stone. If it was just household idols, he'd have made more. This was legal. Why did you steal my gods? You took all my stuff. Now you took my gods. And Jacob explains why. Then Jacob answered and said to Laban, because I was afraid, for I said, perhaps you would take your daughters from me by force. With whomever you find your gods, do not let them live. In the presence of your brethren, identify what I have of yours and take it with you. Jacob was pretty secure in himself right about now, wasn't he? For Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. Hmm. By the way, why do you think Rachel stole them? Perhaps it was a backup plan. If things don't work out with Jacob, if something happens to Jacob, if she still got the title deeds to her dad's possession, maybe it was a backup plan. Pure speculation, do with that as you will. My mind has questions. Sometimes I don't get answers. All right, now Rachel had taken the household idols, put them in the camel saddle and sat on them. And Laban searched all about the tent, but did not find them. And she said to her father, let it not displease my Lord that I cannot rise before you, for the manner of women is with me. And they searched, but did not find the household idols. Now it's gonna be codified later under the law that in the woman's typical time, that things that she sat on and touched were considered unclean. And so you didn't mess with them. It wasn't new in the law, it was just codified in the law. It was understood at this time. And as a father, if I went to my daughter's room and she said, I'm sorry, Daddy, I, I can't stand up in this chair because, you know, there's a thing going on. I'd be like, we'll see you later. <laughs> so it wasn't just Jacob and Laban that knew how to work the field, right? All right. Uh, let's see. Verse 36. Then Jacob was angry and rebuked Laban. And Jacob answered and said to Laban, what is my trespass? What is my sin that you have so hotly pursued me? Although you've searched all my things. What part of your household things have you found? Set it here before my brethren and your brethren, that they may judge between us both. These 20 years I've been with you. Your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried their young, and I have not eaten the rams of your flock. That which was torn by beasts I did not bring to you. I bore the loss of it. You required it from my hand, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. There I was in the day the drought consumed me. And in the frost by night, and my sleep departed from my eyes. 
Thus I've been in your house 20 years. I served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flock, and you've changed my wages 10 times. So much for the plan for him to depart for a few days and then return, right? There's far-reaching ramifications to their actions. 20 years for Jacob up until this point, but I digress. Verse 42, unless the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, Surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. Amen. And Laban answered and said to Jacob, These daughters are my daughters, and these children are my children, and this flock is my flock. All that you see is mine. But what can I do this day to these my daughters or the children from whom they've born? Laban gets the point. Even it's like, well, I consider these my daughters and these my grandchildren. This is, my, this is all my stuff. And then he remembers the dream. But what am I going to do? Hmm. Verse 44, now therefore come, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. Then Jacob said to his brethren, gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap and they ate there on the heap. Laban called it Jager Sahaduth, but Jacob called it Gilead. And Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me this day. Therefore, its name was called Gilead. Also Mizpah, because he said, may the Lord watch between you and me when you're absent from one another. Make no mistake, this is not a friendly covenant they're making. This is not family party time. They're making this covenant because they don't trust each other. How many of you own property and you might have a deed of trust? You, you have a deed of trust because the bank trusts you to make the payments? No, because they don't. You have a deed of trust because you don't trust the bank to honor their obligations. The bank does not trust you to make the payments. So you have a deed of trust spelling out both of your obligations. I trust that as long as you do this, I will fulfill my part, etc. That's what they're doing. They are making a covenant with each other. It is not a covenant of trust. It's a covenant of witness. And one of the parts of this covenant of witness is boundary lines. This is a property line. Partly because the teraphim are gone. The title deeds are gone. Laban is probably insecure about his property markers, and everyone involved wants to know, where's the property marker? Well, it's right here. Verse 50, if you afflict my daughters, or if you take other wives besides my daughters, although no man is with us, see, God has witnessed between you and me. Then Laban said to Jacob, here is this heap, and here is this pillar which I have placed between you and me. This heap is a witness, and this pillar is a witness that I will not pass beyond this heap to you, and you will not pass beyond this heap and this pillar to me for harm. It's a property line. Verse 53, the God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, and the God of their father judge between us. And Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. Just a note about this verse. This is the only place in scripture you find the term God of Nahor. So we gotta ask the question, who's Nahor? Nahor is Abraham's brother. Now we know that God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. And he told him, leave your family, leave your relatives and go to the land that I will show you and I will make your way prosperous. And so he did. This is pure speculation from this point out. So do with this as you will. Scripture calls God the God of Nahor in this one place. We don't make doctrine off of one place in Scripture, but it does bring up some interesting questions. We know that God appeared to Abraham and called him out. Did he also appear to Nahor and call him to stay? Because you see, when Abraham went to seek a wife for his son Isaac, he sent his son Isaac, or actually he sent his servant Eleazar, He sent him to procure a wife from his father's household. 
from his brother's descendants. If Abraham was a man of God and Nahor was a man of God, it would make sense why God would want Abraham's children to seek wives among Nahor's children. We know one of the reasons why Abraham did not want his son Isaac to take a wife from the Canaanites is because they were cursed. God had pronounced a curse on the Canaanite line. Do not take a wife from this land here where these people are cursed. Go to my father's house. So just by this one little passage in scripture, I, I have this question mark. Did God reserve Nahor back here and his family as a godly line from which Abraham and his descendants could procure a wife for both Isaac and Jacob? If so, God is quite the planner, isn't he? There are no details left undone. All right, so anyway, that was sideline. Verse 54, then Jacob offered a sacrifice on the mountain and called his brethren to eat bread. And they ate bread and stayed all night on the mountain. And early in the morning, Laban arose, kissed his sons and daughters and blessed them. Then Laban departed and returned to his place. All right, so what we are doing today, we're going to be looking at big picture items. We all know that God is a God of big picture, amen? When we talk about universal items, it can be something that has a universal application among men or a universal application among the church or a universal application among Israelites or a universal application among the entire universe. And folks, God has a plan for each and every one of them. There are big picture items that we encounter in scripture that if we fail to understand the big picture, it will trickle down into every aspect of our life. Let's talk about creation, for example. If you are a Christian and you believe in God and you believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and you believe in the inerrancy of his word, yet you do not believe Genesis 1-1, I'll be bold, you're either ignorant of the scriptures or you have chosen to ignore a scriptural tenet, one of which is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you believe in John 3.16, you need to believe in Genesis 1.1. Because if you cannot believe Genesis 1.1, you will not believe John 3.16. God's entire word is sacred. It's his spoken word, he inhabits it, and he values it above his very name. Big picture, if we don't understand the big picture of things, we get confused in the application and the smaller pictures that revolve around them. This is one of them. Despite all of the trickery that's gone on with Isaac, his wife, Jacob, Esau, Laban, all of this time period is full of trickery and deceit, right? Despite all that, God blessed him. Why? Was it because Jacob was so good? No. So hardworking? No. Such a faithful witness? Nope. Or any other thing that Jacob did? Nope. God's blessing on Jacob was not a Jacob thing. It was a Genesis 12 thing. Turn your Bibles to Genesis 12. We're going to read verses 1 through 3. All of this is familiar. We have done this many times in the past few months as we've gone through Genesis, but it's all part of the big picture. Genesis 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abraham, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And you guys have heard me say a thousand times, there is no expiration date on this promise. There's no expiration. This does not expire. So it's not a Jacob thing. It's a Genesis 12 thing. It's also a Genesis 15 thing. Jump forward to Genesis 15, if you would, please. We'll pick up in verse 1. 
After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? And this heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. And he brought him outside, and he said, Look now towards heaven. Count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? And he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. We'll stop there. Now we know that God called Abraham to cut these pieces and to set them in pieces. We also know that this is where the term cutting a deal comes from. Because they would cut it in half. They would separate the two pieces. The two parties making the deal would walk back and forth between the pieces, arm in arm, repeating their part. If we're looking at it as selling a piece of property, I will sell you this property for X amount of dollars. The other party says, I will pay you X amount of dollars in monthly installments of XXYZ. They're walking back and forth, outlining, reciting their part of the deal. And as a witness, these pieces here that were shortly before live animals cut in half and separated, and part of the unwritten, unspoken was that I will do my part and you will do your part, but if you decide not to, hmm, <laughs> don't let this happen to you, right? It was a very graphic example of the seriousness of covenants. Now what's cool about Genesis 15 is when God has them separate the pieces and it's time to walk back and forth between the pieces, God feels philosophically says to Abraham, Sit down now, Daddy's got it. Take a nap, rest. God walks between the pieces, and God names the covenant, and there's only one side. There's only one side. Abraham has nothing to bring to the party, so God puts him on the stool. You wait here. Daddy's got work to do. God recites the covenant that he and he alone will perform for Abraham. And he signs it with his own name. God has all the part to play. God has all the blessings to give. He has all the work to do. He pays the price 100%. Abram sits on a stool and waits. Philosophically. He was actually sleeping, but you get the point. So God's faithfulness to Jacob was not a Jacob thing. It was a Genesis 12 thing and a Genesis 15 thing and a Genesis 28 thing. So jump forward to Genesis 28, please. We'll pick up in verse 1. Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him, charged him, and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padanaram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take yourself a wife from there of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you that you may be an assembly of people and give you the blessing of Abraham. Notice that singular. Give you the blessing of Abraham to you and your descendants with you that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger, which God gave to Abraham. The blessing of Abraham is not a piecemeal in which people can decide which they will and will not receive or will and will not accept. The blessing of Abraham is exactly what God says it is, nothing more, nothing less. The blessing of Abraham was passed down to Isaac and to Jacob and hence to the land and the nation of Israel. So it's not just a Jacob thing, but it's not just a Genesis 15, 12, or 28 issue, it's also a Galatians 3 thing. This is where it begins to apply to us directly. Please turn to Galatians chapter 3, beginning in verse 13. 
Galatians 3, 13. For Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, as it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak in the manner of men. Though it is only a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. And this I say that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God and Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. For the, if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. The gist of this, as we've talked about many times, is that the covenant given to Abraham was before the law. The law was an issue not of whether or not God would be faithful to the promise, but whether or not a person would be able to participate in it. Hmm. If you do this, God says, then I will do this. If you remember me to keep my Sabbath, if you remember the Lord your God, he lays out all the stipulations. I will be your God. I will bless you coming in. I will bless you going out. All of these things. But when you forget, not if, when you forget the Lord your God, I will send pestilence. I will send plagues. I will send curses. So the issue was never whether God will be faithful to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the promise that he gave Abraham. The issue was whether or not the people at that time could participate in it. This is also a, a Luke chapter 20 thing. Turn with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 20. We're going to look at verse 37 and 38. This one's a little eye-opening. Luke chapter 20, verses 37 and 38. Luke chapter 20, verse 37. And this is Christ speaking here. But even Moses showed in the burning bush passage that the dead are raised. When he called the Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. For he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. I want to paint a slightly different picture today than what I've painted before about God's faithfulness, particularly to Abraham. Jesus said, God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. You know what that means? Abraham is now in God's presence. Abraham is in the presence of the Lord. God has given Abraham several eternal everlasting covenants. And Abraham is in his presence. If God annulled those covenants and set them aside or broke his word, he has to look at Abraham when he does it. Abraham in God's presence. And as you guys know, by this point, I'm talking about replacement theology. Those who say that the church has replaced Israel, that they're done. God no longer has a plan for them. They're done. They're out. All Israel is a church now. If God takes that position, he has to look at Abraham and say, I know I told you it was eternal, but I think you misunderstood. I know I said everlasting, but I meant temporary. I know I said I am faithful to work and to do according to my word, but I only meant until I got tired of it. I'm being facetious and I'm being hard because this is a big picture item that has direct impact on our churches, on our fellowships, on our personal walk with the Lord. Because you see, it's also a Romans eleven twenty nine 29 thing. I'm gonna read that to you real quick. You don't have to turn there. We're kind of running short on time here. Romans chapter 11, beginning in verse 25. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. That blindness, in part, has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. 
And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. I don't know how many times you guys have. Growing up in the church, I heard literally thousands of times this passage taught the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Amen? That's what the word says, right? I have heard this specifically pointed at the church, to the church and the church only. The problem with this is that's not the context it was written in. The context it was written in is that the Israelites are enemies of the gospel for your sake. But for God's sake, they're precious as far as election goes. And the gifts of calling of God are without repentance. In other words, God is not done with them. God's eternal covenants, God's eternal promises, what he promised, he meant. What he said he would do, he will do. God is not a man that he should lie. He is faithful. Amen? So, what does this all mean to us? Well, it means a lot. As God told Laban in Genesis 31, 24, God came to Laban, the Syrian, in a dream by night, and said to him, Be careful that you speak to Jacob neither good nor bad. You see, folks, there's hard words here. And the hard words are, our opinion don't matter. God's word matters. There are many examples in life where we have varying opinions. There are things that sweep through our culture, through our nation, through our society, through our churches, where we have opinions. We can never, ever elevate those opinions above God's word. I can list multiple examples. Sexual purity no longer matters because of culture. Wrong. It still matters. The sanctity of human life in the womb and out no longer matters because culture has changed their mind. Wrong. It still matters. A baby in the womb is still a baby in the womb. A baby out of the womb is still a baby out of the womb. Even during a 28-day period after live birth. And you guys know what I'm talking about. What God says is true is true. Whether society likes it or whether we like it. Whether society accepts it or whether we accept it. The difference is if we love Jesus and we love his word, we want to love what he loves. We want to see what he sees. We want to think what he thinks. Just as a, the notes that I went in to grab this morning, I didn't, I didn't find, but I'm, I'm remembering now the, the content. The word church appears in your New Testament 70 times. That word, church. If God says something once, it's important, right? No argument. If he says it twice, take notice, it's important. Three times, it's, 70 times, that's really important, right? Okay. The term, the exact term, God of Israel, appears in your Bible 216 times. And not just in Old Testament. That's Old Testament and New. 216 times. You add to that the exact term, the exact phrase, God of Abraham, and to that, God of Isaac, and to that, God of Jacob, 289 times in your Bibles, Old and New Testament. My point is this. If God is not faithful to Jacob, if God is not faithful to Israel, why would he be faithful to you? And more importantly, why would he be faithful to me? Jacob had a period of trickster. Jacob had a period of disreputable action. Jacob had his time of stumbling. Jacob had his time of falling. And people would have want us to believe, Jacob, both the man and the nation, people would want us to believe you can only stumble and fall so long before God throws you away. Well, folks, I can tell you today, praise God for that. Because I spent a long time stumbling and a long time falling. 
And God called me when I was young and he told me specifically, I've called you to preach and teach my word. And it terrified me, so I ran. And the things that I did should have disqualified me from ever, ever serving his kingdom again. I know what I've been saved from. And such were some of you. Each and every one of us have stumbled. We have fallen. We've tripped up. We've gone astray. The word tells us all we like sheep have gone astray, right? That word we is talking to the church, not the world. All we have gone astray. But I praise God that his faithfulness causes me to stand here today, not mine. His faithfulness towards Israel, towards Abraham, towards Isaac, both the individuals and the nation is what's going to cause them to stand. And as you guys know, this replacement theology, this viewpoint that God has stopped loving the people that he said, I will never stop loving. That God has stopped calling the people that he said, I will never stop calling. That God has stopped chasing the people that he said, I will never stop chasing. Would make us question God's faithfulness and God is faithful. Amen. From a personal perspective, if you are a child of God and you have given your life to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the most important topic is his faithfulness. Is he faithful or not? Absolutely. Is he true to his promises? Absolutely. Does he keep his word? Absolutely. Even when we fail or stumble or get weary, he is able to keep us from falling and present us before his presence with singing. No matter what we go through, his promises are yes and amen. Genesis is our book of beginnings. And from the very beginning, God has shown he is faithful. So even though I appear to have a very, very heartfelt issue on this topic, and I do, the serious thing for us as Christians, if we take a position on Israel, let's say, and we've studied God's word, and we, we take a position on a certain doctrinal topic based on scriptural tenets, we have taken the right approach. If we take approach based on emotion or based on society or based on opinion, we have not built our house upon the rock, we've built it upon sand. And that is a structure which is destined to collapse. Likewise, personally, And it always has to boil back down to personal applications. Know that if God is faithful to Jacob with what he did, he's going to be faithful to you. If he's faithful to me with what I did, he's going to be faithful to you. Because he's the one that's sure. His promises are yes and amen. Not only will he not fail, he cannot fail. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we thank you for presenting us the big picture of your heart, of your love, of your calling, of your surety, of your faithfulness, and that microcosm picture that in all of that, you stand before us, arms wide, face to face, eye to eye. You know us by name. You know everything about us. And you still love us despite that. So, Father, I pray if there are any under the sound of my voice that don't know you, I pray you would use this time to open their eyes to the fact that you love them, that your cross paid the price for their sins, that your death, burial, and resurrection proved how much you love each and every one of us. Salvation is very simple, very plain, but it's serious. But if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So if you're hearing my voice today and you've never made Christ your Lord and Savior, today's a good day. Today is a day of salvation. So I would ask you to pray that prayer, just to confess with your mouth, Jesus, Jesus Christ, I love you. Thank you for dying on the cross. And thank you, Father, for raising him on the third day to be my Lord and my Savior and then commit your way to him and before him. For those of us that do know you and love you, Jesus, 
I thank you for your faithfulness. And thank you for your faithfulness to present us your word so that we can have that big picture as well as that intimate knowledge of our Lord and Savior.